Hello everyone, welcome back. Today we will continue reading the War Second Lore. Last episode we had an introduction to the War Second Universe that is laid out. A world that was diverged from ours, similar to ours, a millennia ago. And we had an introduction to the Cabal, the Razan Strait battle of all is taking place. And we were introduced to Roman Volkov. Now if you haven't went to Amazon and did the skill, I highly recommend it. It is a pre crude of the story and you will basically be in the command of Roman and making choices of things to do, where to go and get a more feeling of the story. So without further ado, here we go. Today we're going to read about Chancellor Lockwood. Chancellor Lockwood. Chancellor Lockwood has sacrificed every luxury and distraction in his r rapid rise to leadership. This is Chancellor Lockwood. The Kingdom Republic of Rizland rests on his back. The new Chancellor has much more to prove. Can he turn the KRR back from the brink of falling into chaos? Kingdom Republic of Rizland. In a landslide, the Kingdom Republic of Rizland, KRR for short, has elected the seasoned military strategist Riker Lockwood as chancellor. The former general is a breath of fresh air in a nation that has grown complacent as generations have passed with the KRR as the dominant world power. The nation is wealthy, but stagnant, and in the eyes of many fashion factions, it is in danger of being unseated by the cutting edge technology of sovereign, sovereignty of triumphants. Vast oil supplies fuel the KRR's military complex, and the big stick they carry is their nuclear arsenal, which outclasses the rest of the world's nuclear capacities combined. Chancellor Lockwood has sacrificed every luxury distraction in his rapid rise to leadership. No family, few friends, Many strategic allies, his people adore him for his devotion to the kingdom at the exclusion of all else. His dedication and brilliance give them confidence that the KRR will once again rise to the economic and military supremacy where their illustrious country belongs. Written by Daniel Coleman. So that's Chancellor Riker Lockwood. Next character we have is Baron Valorant. Valorin, the second generation baron. He, sw he wears the pens his baron father gave him as a reminder to live up to the man he was. Most say he's already surpassed him. Prime Baron Jean Valorin is a man among men. He has mastered dozens of skills from marksmanship to swordplay to various fine art disciplines. He may intimidate on first meeting, but by second counter, he's the guy you want at your side in a fight or offering a toast at your table. He is equally distinguished among, alongside his wife at a gala as he is at the head of his fleet. It is impossible to not admire this charming, talented leader of the United Order of I. As a man who enjoys the finer things in life, Baron Valoran brings new meanings to the art of war. To see his fleet sail, art crafts, carriers, warships, escorts, support ships, submarines is a thing of magnificence. To watch Baron Valoran orchestrate them in battle is a thing of beauty. He is adept as a commander, yet merciful when it comes to human life, quick to accept surrender and civilized in his treatment of prisoners. Each island in the UOI has its own laws and its own baron. Currently under the leadership of Valoran, his lap pen in the shape of scepter, a Valoran family heirloom worn by a number of barons has come to signify his unprecedented support. Even though Jean Valoran is the first prime Baron in his line, it is hard for men in the UOI to imagine a prime baron who doesn't wear the Valoran pen. An island unified decades 
a goal to share technologies, trade resources, offer superior defense of each island state, and more recently, to reach out and claim their share in a world bent on acquiring the shrinking reserves of precious resources. Before Valoran, the prime baron position passed frequently between isles. Valoran, popular with all the factions in the URI, appears to be here to stay. The combined contributions of the URI offer all citizens a standard of living as refined as any in the world. Fine clothing, abundant food, culture art, all the luxuries of life. Like a hive, in which many contribute to the benefit of all. When circumstances demand, the UOI can rally vast numbers of modern ships for Prime Baron Baloran to command in defense of their interests. With a naval armada compatible of facing any in the world, the UOI would rule the seas if it wasn't for the pesky, uncivilized ships of Rao Castra, which look more like a surplus sail on the water than an actual navy. The Rao Castrians are not actual threat to the modern and visually stunning great vessels of the UOI, with the exception of Thado Lathabo's commanding ship, the Kraken. The disgraceful pirates have a way of showing up at the exact wrong spot in the trade routes at the worst possible time. If not for the concerns about the Kraken, the UOI could bring civility to the seas and earn the tolls and tariffs commiserate with providing safe routes to all. Written by Daniel Coleman. Next we have Zane Leon, a glorious entity of whites on the other side of life. Zane Leon and the devoted brotherhood. This group takes no prisoners. He carries on the oldest of mantles, the brotherhood of ruin. His military leadership has led him to victory after victory. Leaders of Forsaken. The Brotherhood of Ruin. The Brotherhood of Ruin is an ancient nation, the oldest civilization on the planet according to the records. Strict adherence to their way of life has obviously served them well, allowed them to persist through so many generations. The field of corruption that fills the world is another passing phase. When the plague is secured, the Brotherhood plan on being the center of the cleansing. Their fearless leader, Zane Leon, leads on the battlefront as well as in religious observance. He doesn't fear his own sweet death, which he will embrace after doing all he can for his people. His fellow members of the Brotherhood feel the same. If they die before succeeding in a mission, they know a better world awaits and it will be more glorious than anything their mortal mind can imagine. Leona is so close to gaining the resources the Brotherhood sorely needs to accomplish their goals. He can practically taste it. This visionary has leveraged gunpowder and scarce tactic to complete, compete with the nukes, space weapons, and aircraft carriers of all other nations. For the time being, they rely on simply yet effective weapons of war, countless bullets, well-placed pipe bombs, and widespread fear. Zayn Leon is incorruptible. The intrigue, corruption, and capitulation so widespread in the world doesn't tempt him. While other nations sign treaties with one hand and stab each other in the back with the other, Zayn doesn't waste time or efforts on such methods. Brute force, intimidation, and collecting large ransoms are his tactics. He will rise to the strength of the Brotherhood to row across the world, inch by inch, if required. Once he gains the necessary resources, he can wage war and purify the world in a degree not seen by the Brotherhood for generations. Written by Danny Cole. So today we read Chancellor. Riker Lockwood, Baron Jean Valoran, and Zane Leon. Next time, we'll continue with President Ziana, Thado Lathabo, and Premier Zoth. I hope you like that one. I will see you on the next episode.